Today is Easter. And the fact that you're here today tells me something about you. Either that you love Jesus and you're here to celebrate. Or that you love somebody that loves Jesus and you're here because they pulled you here. Or maybe you just think this is where you're supposed to be on Easter. And no matter why you're here, I'm glad that you're here. There's no better place to be ever than in God's house with God's people. And so I am glad you're here. I want to give us all an overview of what we believe. I want to remind us from the ground up what we believe and why we believe it. Because the truth is, like I said earlier, Christianity is true. This is not a blind faith that we have. It's not a blind faith that we have. A lot of people look at faith and they think that that's the meaning of faith. It's taking a step where we can't see. And there is a truth to that, that there is a step that we have to take, but we can see. God has given us lots of things that we can see. Now, there are some things we can't, right? And we hold on to those things with a certain sort of blind faith. But it's not really that blind because we have a good reason to believe that it's real. For example, if I go into my pantry and I know for sure that there is cereal in my pantry, okay? Now, if the lights are off, I may not know exactly where the cereal is, but I've got a good idea because I've seen it there before. And so if I feel around, I'm going to get really close. Now, if I walk outside, let's say, into my backyard, and I say, there might be cereal there. And I'm groping around in the darkness. I'm not going to find anything. That's a blind faith. But it's a, I have it on good evidence that there's cereal in my pantry because I bought it. I put it there. That's kind of how God is. The truth is there are three questions that we can't answer unless God is real, unless he exists. I want to ask you these questions and just think about these as we go. First thing is, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something in the world? Why is there a world at all rather than nothing? Because everything that exists has to have a cause. Everything that begins has to have a cause. You wouldn't walk through a forest and see a car there and say, wow, isn't it amazing that nature just created this car here? No, you would say, who made this? Who put this here? What kind of car is that? Because we believe and we know this deep down, everything that exists needs a cause. Why is this car here? Well, somebody put it there or something put it there. And then we know this, that the universe exists. I hope we, I hope we know that. I hope you believe that, that this is a real world that we live in. That there is a real world around us. And so if everything that exists needs a cause, then the universe exists. And so it needs a cause. So what caused the universe? And they say, well, it was the Big Bang. And I would say, well, who banged the Big Bang? The only cause that makes sense has to have a few things going on for it. It's got to have no material, right? It can't be made out of matter. Because then it would be a thing that needed a cause to begin with. So it's got to be immaterial. It has to be transcendent, meaning it's got to be beyond the universe. Because if it's in the universe, then it can't create the universe because it would need the universe to exist in the first place. And then the other thing about this cause that is really important is it has to be a person. Because if it's just a thing, right? Like you may have heard the argument, well, guns, they don't shoot people. If you did needs a person, because the gun, it just, it just sits there. It just sits there. Or, or a rock, right? Rocks don't break things. They're just rocks. People can use rocks to break things, but otherwise they just sit. Or a domino. If you set up an amazing chain of dominoes, it will just sit until the end of time. Unless something causes the first one to fall. And so you need someone who can make a decision to push something. Otherwise, it's just cause and effect all the way back. And so the only cause that seems to fit all of that is God. So there, there's one question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Here's another question. Why does everything look so designed? Why does everything look so designed? If you open a book, again, if you open a book, your question is not, why is this book the way that it is? Your question is, who wrote this book? Who wrote this book? You would never open a book and think, well, this book has just existed from eternity past. No, you'd say someone wrote 
this book. Because books, by nature, are incredibly designed. Now, you might open up a book and it's just full of random letters and numbers. That's meaningless. But if you open a book that makes sense to you, there's something amazing about that. And so all of us, we see things that look designed like a book or a car or a watch, and we say, well, there's got to be somebody that made this thing because it's so intricate and it works so well. It makes sense. It's designed. Second, the universe that we live in tends to get less designed, not more designed. It tends to be simpler. So like, for example... Uh, They say out in space that things are falling apart, that there's more space dust than there was at the beginning of the universe because things break and get destroyed. They don't tend to make new and more complex things. For example, if I leave my watch sitting on the table for 45 billion years, let's just say, when I come back to that watch, do you think it's going to be in a good state of repair or a bad? Probably a bad one. It's going to tend to get worse and more broken and less functional over time. But the way that the universe is, is look how amazing humanity is, right? Think about just a single cell in your body. I don't know if you've ever, in science class, looked under a microscope and seen just one cell and how complex that tiny little microscopic thing is. And your body is made up of billions of cells. And some of those cells have different jobs than others. if, if one of them stops doing what it's supposed to do, we call that cancer. And the fact that any of us get to live for even a day without just stopping existing altogether because our cells hold together and everything functions the way it's supposed to function, that's amazing. There's design in that. And the only designer that makes sense is one like we talked about already, and, and I think that's God. The universe looks so designed because somebody designed it. And here's the last question. We can't answer this without God. How do you make sense of your moral experience? What I mean by that is that you believe and I believe that there are things that are right and wrong. Right? Most of us, we might get bogged down in the details, right? You might say, well, is it right to jaywalk? I don't know. It's a little, little foggy. But none of us would say it's right to beat up children and steal from them. No, none of us would say that. Even people who are deeply, deeply opposed to the idea of God, they see something happen like that, or they see, they read about things like that happened in the Holocaust, where these horrible, horrible experiments were done on children, and they say, that's evil, that's evil. And all of us do that, just automatically. And in fact, when people don't do that, we have a name for them, and it's psychopath. Somebody who's broken that their sense of right and wrong is broken. It's it's supposed to be a certain way, right? The world is supposed to be a certain way, and that's that's all this moral experience. We sense that. Now, without God, there can't be a real right and wrong. Okay? If we're all just an accidental collision of cells and or I mean not even of cells, of atoms, if atoms just randomly slam together and somehow we now we exist through billions of years of evolution, if, if that's the truth, then there is no right and wrong. Because all of us are just, at the end of the day, just atoms, right? It doesn't matter if I break a pencil versus if I break a leg of someone else. Or if I, you know, if I decide to build something or if I decide to burn a building down. It doesn't really matter. Because if there is no God, there is no right and wrong. But... We all believe in these things, that some things are evil and that some things are morally beautiful. And so that points us toward God, one who sets the rules, who puts things the way that they should be, who gives us the sense that there is a right and a wrong. Okay, so if God exists, that gets us to a good place of believing in God. However, however things still aren't quite right because the truth is we're confronted with other truths. Like, what is this God like? What, what makes God who he is or who she is or who it is or who they are, right? Every religion is completely different. And you may not think that, but if you dig down into religions, you see that Islam believes in a single, one, only God. And in Christianity, we believe in one God who is Three persons, right? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
or Buddhism, maybe depending on what strand of Buddhism, some say, well, there is a God, and some say there isn't, and we're all striving toward different things. And so we have to take the claims of these different religions seriously and say, which one actually fits the real world that we live in? And I would challenge you to read the Bible. We won't walk through all of that, but read the Bible and just, just see if these things match up with your own moral experience, for example. Or if this seems like a God who could have made the universe the way that it is. But then when you get to the New Testament, you're going to get to something even more important and even more serious. And that is what we're celebrating here today. That's the resurrection. The resurrection. Because the truth is, if Jesus actually did rise from the dead, then Christianity is true. And every other religion is false. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So if he says those kinds of things, and then he comes back to life after he's been killed, we should take him seriously. So why should we believe that the resurrection actually happened? Why should we actually believe that Jesus rose from the dead? I'm going to give you three good reasons. The first is that Jesus was a real person. Jesus of Nazareth actually existed. Even if you have a problem with the Bible... Jesus is attested by other authors of the time, like Josephus. Jesus was a real person. He existed. Second, we have good reason to believe that the tomb was empty. Good reason to believe that the tomb was actually empty. We have five very early sources written within 50 years of Jesus' resurrection or death. One is the account of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, according to Luke, the physician. The testimony of Levi, the tax collector, also known as Matthew. The good news, according to John. The news of the anointed Jesus of Nazareth, according to John Mark. And then the second letter of Paul of Tarsus to the Corinthians. And you might say, well, those are all Bible books. And I would say, yes, they are, but they were written by five different people. And they all report the same thing, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And here's the biggest one. The disciples of Jesus actually believed that he rose from the dead. They actually believed this. So there are some possible options for why they believed this, and let's, let's go through these really quickly. Why did they believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, possibly they made it all up. They made it all up. A lot of people think that, that they made it all up. So that's true. They were all very, very committed to a lie that gained them absolutely nothing. In fact, all of them were martyred except for John, who died alone in exile for his faith. If it was made up, if it was a lie, why would they not just say when they're being tortured to death, eh, we made it up. Instead, they stood and they were murdered by lions, by, like I said, torture. Peter, legend says, was crucified upside down. If this was a lie, they sure made up a crappy lie. Because here's the other thing. They didn't gain anything other than Jesus. They sure didn't get rich. Sure didn't get rich. They didn't get popular. In fact, they were driven underground, right, because of the persecution that came. They didn't gain anything with their families. In fact, almost all of them lost their families because their families thought they were insane. And yet they believed. They persisted in this. So I don't think that they made it up. Now, what if it only looked like Jesus died? Like he did that Romeo and Juliet thing, and he took the potion, and he looked dead, but he wasn't really. Well, the Roman executioner would have wrongly called him dead, and that's a problem because if he was wrong, he would die. right? So that the executioner took his job very seriously. If, for example, he killed some people, and one of them wasn't actually dead, he was fired, and his family got killed as well. If this is true, he somehow healed from wounds that would have killed most people in three days where he had no food, no water, inside of a tomb. Somehow, in his weak state, he actually was able to roll away this stone that it took several people to put in place, from the inside, no less. And finally, he would have then snuck past the Roman soldiers who also had their lives on the line who were guarding his tomb. So again, that doesn't really make much sense. There's another option. 
his body got stolen or they misplaced it. Or maybe then they, after they took his body, they were still grieving so much that they hallucinated that he had risen from the dead. Looking like we already said, the Roman guards who were guarding the tomb, who were trained soldiers, they would not have just let his disciples come and take his body away. In fact, they were placed there for the specific purpose of keeping it in place. And then if they all hallucinated the same thing at the same time, that is something that has never happened ever in the history of humanity that we know of. And here's the, here's the last option. Why did the disciples believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Maybe he actually did. And if he actually did, then we need to take the Bible very, very seriously. If it tells us the truth about something like that, we need to take the Bible very, very seriously. Because Jesus also took the Bible very, very seriously. And the Bible tells us this horrible story of human failure and sinfulness and evil. If you read the Old Testament, it's not very encouraging. You get a little blip of encouragement maybe in the Psalms. There, there are some good characters every so often, but even then, they always fail. They always fail. And all of us, we live lives like that as well. Unless you are somehow amazing and have never sinned in your life, most of us have many regrets and failures, things we wish we could go back and undo. But the Bible gives us good news as well. It's not just bad, it's, it's good. It tells us about God's love and Jesus' sacrifice for all of us and for all of those people who were wicked and sinful and who failed throughout the Old Testament. And the story starts with God, who is holy. He's holy. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, Moses says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without sin, just and upright is he. 2 Samuel 22, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So God is perfect and his law is perfect, but we have all broken God's laws. But if you look through the Ten Commandments, you start to feel really bad about yourself. Have you ever lied? Or disobeyed your parents? Or have you lusted after someone who is married? Or if you're married, have you lusted after someone who you're not married to? Or have you ever hated someone or wanted them dead? Or stolen something or coveted something that belonged to someone else? Or ever used God's name as a curse word or blasphemed God in some way? Any of those is enough. And probably most of us would say, yeah, I've done all of those things. That's enough to separate us from a perfect God. And I don't say that to make you feel bad, but I want you to know the truth. The truth. Romans 3.23, if you're in Romans. For all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you're not a good person and neither am I. And a lot of us think, well, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. God, God will like me because I'm good enough. I've, I've done enough good, i just got to outdo the bad that I've done. But it just takes one. If I do one wrong thing, if I just kill one person, I'm going to jail. Right? I, I could have given millions and millions of dollars to charity. I could have saved thousands of lives. But if I murder one person in cold blood, it doesn't matter what good I've done. And so God, because he's a good judge, he must punish sinners. Romans 6, verse 23, says this, that the wages of sin, the payment for sin, what we earn for sin, is death. Because God, the good judge, he has to punish evil. And the only way that he can punish evil, because we are wicked, we are evil through and through, is that he must give us death, separation from God. Separation from ourselves, the brokenness forever because of the brokenness that we have inflicted on the world and on ourselves and on God. If it's up to us, none of us go to heaven. If it's just up to us, we're in trouble. And worse, all of us on our own, 
deserve infinite punishment because we've sinned against an infinite God. But Easter changes all of that because Jesus died for us. The Son of God, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life. He never sinned. There was no evil in him. He never broke God's law. He died in our place as a perfect, innocent sacrifice. God substituted the holy for the unholy. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrated his great love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I want to just take a minute and just, just ponder the weight of that. Think, think about how heavy that is. Christ died for us, not while we were trying to do good, right? We weren't trying to be good and holy people. This is while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. So all the punishment that we deserve, Jesus took upon himself. And so now we get a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth Jesus was resurrected from the grave and he beat death as well. So not only does he save us from sin in this life, he saves us from ultimate death and separation from God. So that when Jesus comes and promises eternal life, he means eternal life. It's not that you live happily on this earth and then you just fade away. You live with Christ on this earth and then you live with him forever. Because Christ was raised from the dead as the first fruits. The Bible says the first fruits, the firstborn from the dead. Meaning that there are more to come. And that will be us. That will be us. So in a way, Easter is a celebration of Christ's resurrection. But for us, it's also the celebration that Christ defeated death so that we will live with him for eternity. But this is not an automatic thing. Not everybody goes to be with Christ forever. Because while Christ died for sinners, he doesn't want us to stay that way. He doesn't want to leave us that way. God didn't just kill his son so that he could bring a bunch of evil into heaven. Two things have to happen for us to be right with God. The first is repentance. Repentance. This is turning around, right? So if I'm, if I'm driving toward Lake Worth... And my wife says, I left my wallet at home. Then I have to repent and go back home. Now, that, that's a weird th way to say that because it didn't do anything wrong. But I've got to turn around. And if I say, okay, well, we got your wallet now. But I don't turn around and go back home. Nothing's changed. I've got to actually turn around and go the other direction. We have to change our minds. We also have to turn around. It doesn't mean that you fix your life and then come to Christ. No, it's a thing that comes all at once because we repent, but then we trust in Jesus. So repenting means you're running towards sin and away from God, and then you turn around and you run toward Christ and away from sin. And it's not about being perfect. It's about the direction that you're going, if that makes sense. If you're not repentant, you can't receive God's forgiveness. Right? If I'm running towards sin and I say, love Jesus, do I really love Jesus? No. Am I really trusting Christ? If I'm running towards sin and away from him? No, I'm not. In fact, when Jesus preached in the New Testament, all of the times that he says to get right with God, he says, repent. Repent and believe. Repent. And we do this thing sometimes if we're not careful, where we say, well, I, I prayed the prayer. I, I fixed my life. I, one time when I was a kid, I, I trusted Christ. As though it's a one-time thing, but it's not. It's a new life. It's a new life. Trusting in Jesus means that you deny yourself and you throw away everything that takes you away from him. 
and you run to him. It's like this. If you're on an airplane, let's say. Let's say you're on an airplane, and it's going down. Right? You look out the window, and you see the engine on fire. You're starting to panic. I would be. Let's say the flight attendant is coming down, and she's handing out parachutes. And you take one. You say, man, this is like a nice parachute. And you sit it in your lap while the plane crashes into the ground. <laughs> Did you trust in the parachute? You didn't. Let's say you put the parachute on and you say, all right, I'm ready to go. While the plane crashes into the ground and you die. No, you have to put the parachute on and you got to jump out of the plane. Trust in Jesus is like that. You don't just say, I believe that Jesus was a good guy. I believe that he died. I believe that he died for sinners. None of that is good enough. What you have to do is trust that when Christ died, he died for you. He died for me. That, that's the trust that saves us. That's putting on the parachute and jumping out of the plane. That When, when Christ died, I, I believe he's going to hold me. I believe he's going to save me. And I'm going to trust him to do it. And as we do that, we also repent of sin. It's not really two separate things. It's kind of one thing altogether, which we, we turn away from sin and we trust in Christ. You've got to take hold of him as your Savior. And then when you believe that only Jesus has saved you from your sins, from hell, from the wrath of God, then you belong to him. Then you belong to him. Then you receive eternal life. And your life is going to start to look different. Now, again, you're not going to be perfect in that moment. That would be nice, but it doesn't work that way, right? We turn to Christ, God puts his spirit in us, and then we begin to change. Listen to what Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says. By grace, you've been saved through faith. By grace, through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of your works so that no one may boast. Okay, so, so you can't do it yourself. You, you can't save yourself. You can't do good things enough that you earn enough points. But then here's the last thing. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's say that I'm a soldier in the army. And I'm fighting against the enemy. We have different uniforms. Let's say it's back in the day when uniforms were a thing for both sides, right? It used to be that nations fought against nations, and we had different uniforms. And you could spot who was on the other side by the uniform they were wearing. So let's say I defect, and I go to join the enemy. But I keep my uniform on. And I kill their soldiers still. And I actively fight against them. Did I really defect? Did I really change teams? No. If, if I'm going to change teams, I don't just, I got to put on their uniform. But then I also have to start fighting against the other side. I've got to actually work for my team. So let's say I'm an American. I join the Germans. If I start killing German soldiers and I say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the German army now. I'm on your side. They don't believe me. But if I join their side and I start fighting with them. I start to look, and now I really become who I say that I am. To say you're once saved, always saved, is good, but it gets abused. The truth is that truly saved, always saved. Jesus is not fire insurance, not a prayer you pray one time. Those who truly belong to him start to live different lives. That's how we know. Jesus says this, that you will know them by the fruit that they bear. Listen to this in John 15, 1. This is Jesus talking. He says, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. He's the one who prunes the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and burned. That's Jesus talking. So again, it's not, it's not that your good things are going to save you, but that when you trust in Christ, you get grafted into him. You become a part of the Jesus tree, and your fruit starts to look like Christ. So where are you? That's the question we have to ask today on Easter. Faced with the resurrection of Christ, the one who's coming back to judge the living and the dead, where are you? Maybe you don't believe in God and you're just here. We'll take this stuff really seriously. I don't know if that's any of us here, but if that's where you are, take this really seriously. Because if I'm right, then you have an eternity in the balance. Do your homework. Study. You need to make sure that there is no God before you live your life as if there is no God. Maybe you're here and you believe in God, but you're not sure about Jesus. Same thing. You need to be sure that Christ is not the Messiah, that Jesus is not God before you reject him and live your life in that way. You need to be certain because, again, eternity hangs in the balance and believing in God is not enough maybe you're here and you believe in God and you believe in Jesus but you're not trusting in him to save you and you're not living for him remember that your good works aren't enough to save you you're not going to flip the scales you're still heading in the same place as the people who don't believe in God that's hell and then you have to answer two questions. What, what is stopping you from trusting Jesus today? Right? If you believe in God and in Jesus, but you're not living for him, you're not trusting in him, what is stopping you from that? Maybe you love sin and you don't want to change. Is your sin worth an eternity apart from God? Or maybe you're in a different group and you feel like God couldn't save you from your sins, that there's too much that you've done. There is nothing that can separate you from God except for, except for a lack of trust in him. God can fix the sickest sinner and the most broken person. The Apostle Paul is a great example of that. He literally was killing Christians before he met Christ. And God changed him and saved him. And if he can save someone like that, he can save you. Or maybe you're in another group. Maybe you're trusting in Christ or you've trusted him at some point, but your fruit is rotten. Maybe you're not looking like a Jesus tree as much as you're looking like a thorn bush. Search in your heart and make sure that you really belong to him because real Christians look like Christ. Galatians 5, 19 says that the fruit of the flesh is evident. Sexual sin, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enemies, fighting, jealousy, fits of anger, hate for others, disrespect for authority, divisiveness, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. And then Paul says, I warned you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit looks different. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So look at your fruit. What kind of fruit do you have? And if you say, man, my fruit is garbage, run toward Christ. You're not too far gone. The risen Savior of the world wants you to be saved. And maybe you're here and you're in another group. There are lots of groups. Maybe you've trusted in Jesus. You know it. But you're living in sin and you're miserable. Because sin tends to make you miserable. It seems fun for a season, right? You seem like, oh, this will be fine. This will be good. Nobody needs to know. I can hide this forever. But the truth is that sin is poison. It's poison. 
if I come to you and I have a giant chunk of radioactive metal, right? And it's literally, it's melting my hands because of how radioactive it is. And I say, I need you to hold on to this for me. I hope you would say, get that out of here. I'm not holding that for you. That's what sin does to you, right? Sin sits in your closet, shoots its radiation out, and kills you. You may not feel it at first. In fact, you might feel good at first. It feels nice. But then eventually, you become mastered by it. And it starts to ruin your life and your relationships and your relationship with God and your friendships and your peace and your joy and your kindness and your goodness all start to fade away because you have this sin that you won't get rid of. It's like the guy who kept a bear as a pet, got it as a cub, and it was real sweet and fun and cuddly, and then it grew. One day he went to feed it, and it killed him. That's what sin will do to us. But Christ has come to kill sin. And in Romans 8, we read that we can kill sin in our flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. You are not bound to your sin. You can escape. In Christ, you can be free. So turn back to Christ. You're not too far gone. Kill that sin. And find a church. Doesn't have to be our church. I'd like it to be. Doesn't have to be. Find somewhere with other Christians who are killing sin also, who will help you, who will judge you, who will hold you accountable to the holiness that God has called you to, so that you can live a life of freedom and joy and peace in Christ. Don't wait. Last thought. Don't wait. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. A lot of people say, well, I'll turn to Christ on my deathbed. I'll get saved when I'm, when I'm old. I want to live it up first. You may not get a deathbed. You may not get a deathbed. In the midst of your sin, God might call you to account. And when you stand before God, you don't want to stand before him on your own. So what will you do? Today is the day of salvation. You can disregard God. That's up to you. Or you can turn to him to save you. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing one more song to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And while we sing, sing with us if you know the words. But while we sing, I just want you to think about where you stand. Whether you're going to be with God for eternity. Whether you're trusting in Christ. Whether you have that hope. Or whether you don't. And if you don't, don't wait. Turn to Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. Your love that refuses to let us die in our sins. Love that while we were still sinners, sent your son to die for us. Lord, let us never take your love for granted. As we celebrate Easter today, as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, the greatest miracle in all of human history, let us not leave here today unsure of where we stand. But everyone who is here this morning, who who is trusting in you, I thank you for them. Keep them. For those who are here who are not, convict them. Lord, convict us by the truth of the resurrection as we consider the risen Christ and his great love for us and your mercy and grace, which are new every day for those who trust in you. Lord, let us put sin to death and run toward you. Whether we've been living a life of sin and need to turn or whether we've been stuck in sin lately and need to turn back. We need you. Without you, we can do nothing. But in you, all things are possible. 
The darkest heart can be made clean in you. The dead can rise in you. Lord, have your way in us. In Jesus' name.